Good morning to all of you uh, viewers of Jadal English TV and and welcome to this episode of the uh, Jadal. Today, today we are with uh, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace, two of the mem uh, two members of European Parliament uh, from Ireland, and we're going to discuss the role of EU in the current uh, Gaza situation, and also we're going to ask them about the role of EU Parliament in the post-Ukrainian situation, and also regarding Iran and the possibility of imposing more and uh, new sanctions. Hi, Claire, and hi, Mick, and thanks a lot for inviting my uh, for accepting my invitation. Our pleasure. Thanks very much, no Ali. So, um, to start the uh, to start the uh, thing, and uh, I believe like the last time we talked was in 2020, which in which I came to your show and to your podcast, and we discussed uh, the situation in Iran during COVID, and and it was like a very like difficult time because Iran under the height of maximum pressure war, where by by Trump, Bolton, and Pompeo uh, could not afford much uh, doing. Uh, dealing with COVID and asked for $5 billion from uh, from IMF and they refused. <laughs> and, and then I think we were, we were discussing that. But since then, we've come through many uh, real big geopolitical situations. And to start with, I think bef before Gaza, maybe like let's, let's start with this one, with the Ukrainian war and the, the role of EU with this. Because what we've seen with With the, with the Ukrainian war, it seems like the United States is pushing its demands on EU to the level that is like really questioning the sovereignty of European countries. I mean, with something like Nord Stream 2 and the explosion of Nord Stream 2, we are witnessing possibly the biggest te economic terrorism of all times, which has brought the price of energy in Europe to a different level is forcing Germany to deindustrialize and is truly like the de developing European countries. <laughs> if 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 United States has de developed Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and 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 Yemen by war and Iran and Venezuela by sanctions, the Ukrainian war, both the cost and also dictating its energy policy to Germany, to uh, other European countries, is like really, is a process of the development. How do you see that? And what's the conversation in European Parliament regarding that? Is it any resistance from European countries uh, that you have witnessed? Or is EU going to accept it? And if it's the case, so what's the role of EU in 2024? Is it any sovereignty left to EU or no? You think... There's no chance for EU and just going to follow up United States and its dictates. You go. No, you go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, look, at, um, we would argue that the EU approach to Ukraine um, is not very different to the EU approach to what's happening in Gaza. And we are, you're right in the sense that um, The EU has made decisions that are not in their best interest. Um, this is a war that the EU has done nothing to stop. And it has been very problematic for Europe. We introduced sanctions against Russia that are hurting us more than them. And uh, yes, we are behaving very much like a vassal state of US empire. This is a, a US NATO proxy war. It suits the Americans. It was an opportunity to try to undermine Russia. And the EU has given its 100% support to the American project in the effort to undermine Russia. Now, the role of the European Parliament and the institutions has been sad. Um, for example, Uh, Claire and myself, we, twice we put in an amendment in 2022 to the Ukraine resolution in the plenary. And our amendment called on the EU to maximize its uh, potential to bring about diplomacy and dialogue with a view to ending the war and establishing peace. And over 80% 
of the MEPs voted against that. So what they were saying was they wanted the war to continue. Yet at the same time, over 80% of the people of Europe in, in a wide ranging poll expressed a desire for peace rather than continuing to punish Russia. So we had the political class on a very different page to the people of Europe. And not only that, but this is a war that led in 2022 alone, we saw 11% increase in food prices because of the sanctions that we imposed on Russia. And we saw uh, energy prices uh, increase of 27%. And it, you're talking about uh, de industrialization. Well, yeah, the Europeans stopped buying cheap gas from Europe, from Russia, and they started buying expensive uh, LNG from the Americans instead. And we reached a situation where, for example, a German company making cars in Germany was paying four times more for US LNG than a company in America making the same car. So you'd wonder how in God's name we were going to compete and how was the German company going to compete uh, with the American company. And the truth is that it isn't. And what you have is you have German companies now uh, refusing to expand and they're looking at either going to America to follow to get the cheaper LNG over there or go to China where you can get cheap Russian gas. So this is a self-defeating position for the EU and it's 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 self-defeating for the citizens of Europe as well. And let's not forget someone that they don't generally don't even talk about are the amount of Ukrainian working class kids that are actually dying in the war. Some estimates reckon that up to 300,000 working class Ukrainians may have died at this stage, which is an astronomical figure. And dying for what? What's, what's in it for anybody? This war is stupid. We've done nothing to stop it starting. We've done nothing to stop it since it started. We've actually blocked peace breaking out. So, yes, um, this seems madness on the part of the EU. And yes, we are behaving like a vassal state of US empire. But the number of immigrants which will come through Ukrainian war, the cost of uh, post-war construction that United States has already made it clear that it's going to be paid the, by EU. The, the bills are, are not going to be paid by Americans. They're going to be paid by EU. So these questions, I mean, I, I don't think these are ne necessarily Marxist questions. These are even the right in Europe, even the right wing parties in EU who are worried about immigrants, who are worried about uh, this question of sovereignty, don't they ask any of these questions in the parliament? But we haven't seen yep. enough of debate or protest. And that's like almost like comical for someone outside EU. You expect even the far right to shout that, what are, they, what are you doing? You're going to bring 10 million immigrants. Because if you remember in 2015, over less than a million immigrants, the whole EU went on standstill and they all like, like were shouting, we don't want these Arabs, we don't want these like Middle Eastern. And suddenly you have this amazing influx of immigrants, inflation, bringing problem within European societies. And then at the end of the day, uh, the, the industrialization, as, as like Adam Tuss says at the beginning, is more of the war between uh, America and Germany as the pillar, one of the biggest pillars of EU, than is, um, is, is a war between Ukraine and, and Russia. So I want to know, I mean, give us, give us a taste of the debate inside European Parliament, because Parliament is more democratic than EU government. Well, that's your first mistake. You can do that. Um, <laughs> no, the nature of the Parliament. Like yeah. Um, Democracy is, is kind of a bit on the scarce side here. It, these, these institutions aren't quite as democratic as you think. Now, obviously, the council is, uh, they're just the foreign ministers from the member states, and uh, a lot of what they do is done in secret. The commission are unelected. Uh, the parliament are the only ones who are actually directly elected. And... Um, Unfortunately, they have the, they're the weakest of the three institutions. We're not even allowed to initiate legislation. 
we can deal with it when the Commission initiates it and we can argue about it the whole lot, right? So it's really, the European Parliament is mostly a, a talking shop. And if you were asking, well, what are we talking about when it comes to money in Ukraine and, what, and dealing with uh, the, 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 uh, the flow of people fleeing Ukraine from the war? Well, I mean, um, there's no doubt an awful lot of people have come to Europe. But um, because the Ukrainians are white and Christian, there was a welcome for them. Like in Ireland, for example, we've taken about 100,000 Ukrainians in. Now, we struggled to let in a few thousand Afghans, uh, a few thousand Iraqis, because they're not the right color and we're racist. So uh, that's been very much exposed. Uh, but in terms of the money, um, I was on the Ukraine facility. I was a shadow on that. As you know, each group uh, would appoint a shadow uh, for the different pieces of uh, resolutions that would be going to the parliament. And I was, I, I was the shadow on the Ukraine facility where we have agreed to give 50 billion to Ukraine over the next four years. And much of the talk was about this was for reconstruction. Now the dogs in the street know that it'll cost more than a trillion to reconstruct Ukraine. And your question is a good one, which they don't want to talk about in the European Parliament. Who is going to pay for it? Because, and I I put it to them at, at some of the meetings that we had, where you'd have seven shadows at the meeting, right? From one, one from each group. I said, why don't you just be straight up? I said, you're saying you're going to rebuild Ukraine and you're talking about 50 billion. I said, that won't scratch the surface of the bill. It's going to cost a minimum of a trillion, maybe two trillion, right, to rebuild Ukraine. And I said, why don't you actually admit that to the people and that the 50 billion is a token gesture for if you're really talking about reconstruction? And I said, and why don't you just talk to them about who is actually going to pay for it? Are the European citizens going to be asked to put their hand in their pocket to pay for this. Well, they didn't want to ask, they don't want to talk about that because they don't want to upset the people back home in their own member state. So they don't want to talk about where the money is supposed to come from. And I mean, it's like almost, it's like a fantasy world, right? And it's, they're not being honest about this subject, right? Now, on top of that, Let's remember, of the 50 billion, two thirds of this is a loan and one third is a grant. We put in a resolution, we put in an amendment to the resolution and we called for it all to be a grant. We said, listen, if you want to help Ukraine, give them the money to rebuild the place, but don't be giving them loans. But what we're doing with the loans is we're colonizing the place. We're going to own that place. They haven't a prayer of paying back the loans. So they're going to owe us forever. They're going to owe us a whole lot of money. And we're going to give them more money. And they're going to owe us even more money. Right? And they're not going to be able to handle the debt. So what's, what's the future of Ukraine? How are they going to deal with all this money that they owe? We're, they're not going to have sovereignty. And another thing, right? do people realize that in the last three years, European and American corporations have been allowed to buy land in Ukraine on the western side of Ukraine for peanuts. The Ukrainians were forced to change their law so that people, corporations from Europe and America could buy parcels of land up to 10,000 hectares in, each, in, in one purchase, right? And today, the Americans and the European corporations have bought more land on the cheap in Western Ukraine than Russia have taken on the east side. So what's the future of Ukraine? The, the Russians are going to take some of it on the east side. The Europeans and the Americans are taking it on the west side. We're going to, they're going to owe us money forever. We're colonizing the place. It's going to, it's not, it's, it's, Ukraine isn't going to have any sovereignty, but we'll use their cheap work, workers for a cheap labor force in Western Europe. That'll be grand. See, I think it is like there is discussion in the parliament about that but it is generally confined to some of us on the left 
And as you said, Ali, the, increasingly the far right. But the parliament itself is only, if you like, the European vehicle. In all of the member states, there is, I suppose, more of an awareness about this. And I mean, Mix right, the amount of Ukrainian refugees who ended up in Europe has caused a huge dislocation. It's changed the whole thing in Ireland. And actually, the beneficiaries of that have been people who've been focusing on migration. And the far right now are a feature in Ireland when they never were before. It's been fertile ground for them to organise. And the reason for that was the countries in Europe had to allow Ukrainians out if they wanted the war to go on. And the policy of the European Union from the beginning has been to keep this war going, to prevent dialogue, diplomacy and a resolution to keep it going, which, as we've even articulated here, is only in the interests of the US and is certainly not in the interests of anybody else at all. And the only discussion when you raise those points in the parliament from the mainstream parties is that that's Russian propaganda. And the only discussion that we're going into now is how Russia is propagandizing, is paying politicians in the European Parliament, the latest big scandal, they call it Russia Gate, even though there's no evidence of any money ever changing hands. That's all they're discussing, that this is Russian propaganda rather than the facts.